Hello, everyone. I'm Evo Dalder, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly look at news from around the world. And a lot of news there is today. We'll start off with the latest on Ukraine, then start looking at where we are with Russia as it starts to think about celebrating its annual victory uh, day on May 9th. And finally, we'll take a look at what's happening in the Middle East, in particular in the post-Ukraine, post-Russian invasion environment. And joining us from all around the world, Kim Gattas, who is joining us from Beirut and are, is on 4G and, and uh, some kind of power, but it's not the normal power that we have. So, Kim, great to have you. Thanks for having me. Also joining us is Nahal Tusi, Senior Foreign Affairs Correspondent for Politico from Washington, D.C., Nice to be here. And Bobby Gosh, a political a, a opinion editor and opinion columnist for Bloomberg. Bobby, great to have you here as well. I should also mention, sorry, Kim, uh, so distra- distracted by your power that uh, you're a contributing writer for The Atlantic, of course, a non-resident uh, senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, Nahal, let's let's start with you. Just an update here on, on where we are in Ukraine. The Europeans are busy having another uh, uh, sanctions package. The United States is continuing to send arms uh, into uh, into Ukraine and the fighting uh, all over the east and particularly in Mariupol, but also in other parts is really, really intensifying uh, with artillery barrages back and forth. Uh, what uh, what should we be looking for uh, in terms of what's happened in the last week and where do you think this is going? Yeah, uh, the war continues. I'm going to just touch on a few highlights. Uh, right now, the Ukrainians are trying to push the Russians out of a couple of cities in the northeast, Kharkiv and Izium. It's been very intense fighting. It's This is kind of the stage in the war where it sort of becomes, you know, a fighting on attrition, basically you just try to see how far you can get. And it might probably just end up in, resulting in a, in a stalemate of sorts. Uh, but part of the reason they're pushing so hard is because the Ukrainians are worried about what Russia has planned in the run up to May 9th. Now, May 9th is uh, Russia's victory day. It's the anniversary of uh, the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany. And uh, Vladimir Putin has made a really big deal about this day. It's sort of, um, as the Wall Street Journal put it, kind of become like a religion. Uh, and and he, people are concerned that he has some plans, that he might uh, do something big uh, to kind of mark that particular day, or at least expect his troops to do something big uh, to make that day an important one. Uh, there's some reports that he's planning to officially declare a war on Ukraine on that particular day as well. So this is partly in the run up to that. Um, in other aspects uh, of the, the fighting, uh, the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol uh, is still under fire, and there are still attempts to get as many civilians out from there as possible. The Red Cross and others are helping, trying to uh, ferry out folks, but it's not been easy. Um, and on the sanctions front, uh, as you mentioned, EU, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Evo, uh, the European Union uh, has said that it's going to phase out Russian oil use. Uh, by the end of the year. That's not Russian gas, but it's still a pretty big deal. Uh, and this, yes, it comes alongside um, many other happenings, including ongoing uh, fighting um, and, and uh, weapons shipments. Oh, and and reports, uh, some, some very odd reports uh, that I have reason to believe are not authorized leaks by the White House uh, that uh, the U.S. has been giving intelligence to the Ukrainians that have helped them kill generals, uh, Russian generals, as well as sink the Moskova, that massive Russian warship. Uh, now, the Americans are officially out saying, well, we don't, we don't tell them who to kill. We just give them the stuff. And if they want to kill the people with it, well, I mean, we just do it. Uh, and I have one source telling me essentially the same thing and also saying, look, the Ukrainian intelligence is pretty good too. Sometimes it's better than ours. Uh, so the U.S. is trying not to take credit for basically enabling assassinations uh, and and warship sinkings. But let's face it, the U.S. is enabling assassinations and and warship sinkings. Uh, And I'm happy to talk about the Russia visa thing, too, now, if you want, Eva. No, let me let's come back to that in a minute. Uh, 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 Halle just dropped a uh, uh, a story at Politico uh, on on uh, Russians uh, moving to the United States and other places. I want to come back to that in a minute. Uh, uh, Bobby, uh, uh, um, your perspective on where we are and, and, and this 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 point that Nahal just made at the end 
uh, on the intelligence. I mean, on the one hand, it's not surprising. We know that they were providing intelligence information. On the other hand, uh, having the New York Times front page twice, three times in the in, in the last three days, blaring about how the U.S. is central to some pretty big uh, uh, events inside Ukraine. Uh, how do, how is Washington reacting? And how is the rest of the world reacting to that? Does this change sort of the dynamic in which this conflict is being seen? No, I, I don't think it's worth pointing out one more one more highlight uh, to Hall's list, which is that there are now credible reports that another major Russian warship is uh, has been struck by a missile and is in flames. Um, I think this the, this is a little bit of a a Washington story, although it appeared in the New York Times. Um, I don't think the Russians are in any uh, doubt. And have not been since the get-go that the U.S. has been, U.S. and Europe have been passing along uh, specific information to the Ukrainians. That is the working assumption, I think, with the Russians. Um, I think that would surprise nobody anywhere else in the world. Uh, this feels very much like an inside Beltway story, a certain amount of hand wringing about whether a if this is true, b we should be putting it out there that the United States has been providing this intelligence. Um, this is a this is a to to have this appear in the New York Times seems to me a distinction without a difference uh, for the Russians and for uh, the, the wider world. This was already baked into their assumptions. So uh, does that mean, uh, Kim, if you agree with Bobby, um, that the rest of the world is already seeing this? as if this is really a conflict between the United States and Russia, between the West and Russia? Or are they saying, no, it's a conflict between Ukraine and Russia and, and the West is helping Ukraine to defend itself? I um, mean, there is this beginning of a debate about what is the nature of this war mm -hmm. like, uh, which will call, also become relevant when we talk about what, what we may think the Russians may do on May 9th. Absolutely. I think Bob is right. I think that uh, at the beginning of this conflict, there was some doubt as to whether the U.S. would really come to Ukraine's uh, um, assistance forcefully and rally everyone. Did the U.S. have that capacity, that desire? Uh, remember, there were, you know, a lot of predictions that this would be over in two days. Um, but, you know, two months later, a little bit more than uh, uh, two months later, uh, it's clear that Ukraine has the capacity, the ability, the will, the resilience to sustain, to push back, to continue fighting against Russia, but it does so with a lot of U.S. assistance. Um, whether it's military assistance, whether it's the pressure on Russia, the sanctions that we were just uh, hearing about, um, whether it's the U.S. rallying other countries, you know, NATO, really leading the charge. So it's very clearly not just Ukraine versus Russia. It's not just David and Goliath. It is very much the West versus Russia. And I think that means that some countries, and I know we'll get to that in the Middle East, that were hedging their bets, that were trying to stay neutral, that were wondering whether, um, you know, the U.S. was going to do what they think it always does, which is, you know, give um, some, you know, vocal moral support, but not really put its mouth where, put its money where its mouth is. Um, they're seeing that that is changing, that America is actually standing by Ukraine, and they're revisiting possibly uh, their calculations early on in the war about being neutral or hedging their bets too much. Obviously, they want to bet on the winning horse. And it doesn't look like Russia is going to be the winning horse in this, even though um, Putin may declare victory. It's important to remember that victory for somebody like Putin or Bashar al-Assad or Kim Jong-un uh, looks very different than what people in the West consider to be a victory. Victory from a Western perspective has to be constructive, um, but victory for somebody like Putin can be as much destruction as you want. Uh, a lot a lot there, Kim. I think uh, let's unpack a couple of those things because it's really, I think it's really interesting. Uh, and Bobby, just first to you on... Uh, on, on whether you see the pressure, which we'll talk about in more detail in the Middle East, but the pressure more generally among those who have been fence sitters, uh, think India uh, a, a, as one of them, uh, as the, the battle seems to shift and, and, and who wins and who's losing may you know, become a bigger issue, whether 
uh, there is an inclination to say, maybe we need to start choosing sides and sitting on the fence is, is no longer possible. Do you see that pressure happening? Again, India being one of those uh, probably on the biggest fence, about to meet with President Biden later this month uh, uh, as part of the Quad meeting, or do you say, now nah, they're going to play it uh, the same way they've been playing it? There's just a hint of some pressure. It, it, it may not be enough uh, to take a definitive position, but Narendra Modi uh, has been in Europe, has been meeting European leaders, uh, met the German Chancellor uh, Scholl, and he put out a statement saying it was a it was a fairly anodyne statement about a desire to see the the conflict in Ukraine ending which is half a step forward from where he was a couple of months ago at the start of the conflict. So if they're not quite off the fence, then they're certainly fidgeting around on the fence. And the longer this conflict lasts and the the more it becomes clear that Russia is really going to be badly embarrassed by all of this. Um, And I don't mean embarrassed in a moral sense, but that their forces are going to be badly exposed. um, The more fidgeting I think you'll see. None of these countries that are on the fence have paid any price for being on the fence. So there's no economic cost to it. And in fact, in some cases, India might be one. There there is some economic advantage that that they may be getting special deals for for Russian oil and and gas. So uh, it may be a while yet before that becomes a problem and that forces them to take a a firmer position. But for now, fidgeting. That's all we're seeing, fidgeting. Fidgeting while sitting on the fence, uh, which is which is probably the smart political move right now uh, because they can still get away with it. But Nahal, uh, uh, back to you on, on on the question of sanctions. So the EU, uh, uh, I think, is going to have this oil ban. There's a there's a little hiccup with the Hungarians, who are a landlocked country and dependent on a singular uh, pipeline of oil that comes from uh, from Russia uh, and refines a lot of oil there. I, my sense is that that will be sorted out in one form or another. I think the real question is, what's the impact on the Russians? So if they are not no longer able to uh, ship oil to the United States, which they haven't been able to do for a while, and they are no longer able to ship oil to uh, uh, to Europe, uh, what happens to Russian oil? Uh, is this a, does it does it really matter to them? Can, is there other ways they can get it out? Or is uh, is this over time going to be uh, uh, really a, a, the kind of blow that is intended to, uh, it's intended to be? Sorry, I think in and of itself, um, over time, it's gonna it's the type of thing that will take time to show whether it's going to be good or bad for them because you have to understand they can adjust to when it comes to oil. They can find other partners, uh, China. Uh, other countries, India, India, others, other places that simply um, not only are looking for like cheaper alternatives, uh, but which you know want to hedge their bets to a certain extent. Uh, and I don't, I don't, I, I just don't see even just Russian energy in general overall being a death blow because I think the longer it takes for these things to have effects, the longer that a country like Russia can find ways to adjust. Uh, but when you take all of the sanctions together as a whole, you know, everything, the economic sanctions, the financial ones on the banks, uh, there, we're talking not about a country that over time is going to be very wealthy. It's going to be enfeebled. Uh, it's going to struggle. The top uh, echelons might survive and do well. Putin himself is going to be able to eat cake for a long time, I would think. Uh, but I just don't, you know, over time, you're going to see just overall the shrinking uh, of this country's economy and its ability to do anything. I would also add, I, a lot of folks that I talk to say, look, the sanctions are, are one thing, but actually the export controls are what, what's really going to do the better, the more damage over time. Their inability to get new technology, their inability to upgrade their systems, whether it's you know computers in an office or, or, or a tank or whatever, uh, they feel like that's the thing that's really going to have a bigger long-term effect uh, on Russia. Yeah, I think that's actually that that's absolutely right. And I think the, the I'm not sure the administration and the EU have done a, as good a job explaining how important these export controls are as part of the effort to, you know, as the French uh, finance minister put it, to collapse the the uh, the Russian economy. Um, speaking of collapse in the Russian economy, uh, Bobby, uh, uh, pick up the point that Kim uh, made on 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 victory. 
Uh, uh, so we we will have May 9, and Nahal mentioned that too, uh, the uh, Victory Day pr- Parade. I'm sure we'll have uh, huge numbers of militaries. Hopefully they won't break down uh, going uh, uh, through Red Square. Uh, but what does it mean for, for Vladimir Putin? Can he can he be, pull a Senator Aiken, uh, remember, who famously said about Vietnam, let's declare victory and go home? Um, uh, is that what where where we are? Which is possible, and, and I think Kim's absolutely right. You, uh, Putin can define victory in any way he wants. Are we right there, or are we on the other side? And uh, the beginning of a major escalation. How? What do you expect on May 9th? Well, uh, if there's one thing we've learned this year, it is that Putinology is even more fraught than criminology used to be back in the in the Cold War. So, trying to put ourselves into that strange head is is a is a mugs game um we can only sort of think about possibilities yes he could declare victory uh, especially if mariupol the last uh, remaining resistance in mariupol ends before then uh he could declare that they have got the land corridor they want that they have uh the they've expanded even if in a very small way they've expanded uh, the territory they control in in the Donbass, and he could say, job done. Um, I don't think that he's going to go for a, an official declaration of war because that would require him to, um, to provide some explanation for why it's taken this long and why it's taken this escalation. Um, to Even to people who are used to being force-fed on propaganda, some questions will be asked. What I suspect, and I should re-emphasize, this is only a guess, but I think what will happen is that he will play up uh, the, 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 what he has defined as the nature of the enemy. Uh, This is a victory day, as Nahal pointed out. Uh, It commemorates Russia's victory against the Nazis. That's very important, especially since they have portrayed the Ukrainians as being the inheritors of the Nazi uh, ideology. They use that expression all the time when they talk about Ukraine. Um, I think that's what he will talk up uh, during uh, the May 9 uh, celebrations or commemorations. He will say something like, you know, we defeated the Nazis before, and the Nazis are, are back, and Russia will stand up to them, and we're doing that again. And uh, we will prevail just as we did the last time. Something along those lines would be my best guess. Uh, yeah, no, jump in. Just quickly, though, let's say that Putin does declare victory, pulls out the troops he wants, keeps the area he wants. Um, he he would be kidding himself if he thinks that the U.S. for sure is going to be lifting sanctions anytime soon, even if he does that, even some of the sanctions. I mean, my sense from talking to lawmakers is they want to keep these sanctions on until Putin is gone. And that seems to me to be increasing the sense uh, because they just they just feel like this is not a guy you can ever trust, even to be frank, even if he pulls completely out of Ukraine and gives back Crimea, Crimea, that I just don't think the U.S. is going to be, you know, they're going to lift these sanctions until he's he's gone. I, I think that's uh, that, that's a fair assessment. Although if he pulls completely out, the Europeans may have a different view on on, on the sanctions, and that's not unimportant. But 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 Kim, uh, uh, jump in here uh, uh, on on this issue, both of whether you think it is it is possible for him to declare victory and and and, and make that stick at home, uh, and also whether. Uh, if, if Bobby is right that this is about an intensification of a war against the Nazis, the nice thing about that is, since the, the Nazis don't exist, you can always declare a victory over the Nazis as soon as you, whenever you want, right? In that in that sense, uh, it, uh, so it may be even a smarter way. You'd you'd need to, I think, maintain part of Ukraine in order to justify uh, uh, the cost of the war. Uh, but I don't see him giving up that. Uh, whatever he has right now, anyway, uh, he may lose it uh, against the Ukrainians, which is a different uh, a different matter. How do you, what what do you expect to happen on on May 9th? You know, I, I don't expect much on May 9th. I, I it's sort of for me, it, it sounds like it's going to be a nothing burger. Um, I think it'll be somewhere in between declaring victory and declaring war, and you know, talking about the Nazis. I mean, he has sounded you know, not quite there in a lot of 
his um, speeches and talks, you know, sitting at this big table and lecturing people about history, he could get away with more of, of that uh, on, on May 9th. And I think that, um, you know, to, to justify what Russia has just been through and uh, the sanctions that it is facing, the dramatic drop in um, you know, uh, 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 um, power, uh, purchase power, et cetera, that people are facing within Russia, the brain drain that Russia is facing, uh, being cut off from the rest of the world. To justify that, seriously, a leader like Vladimir Putin can come up with anything he wants because there is no direct cost to him, not yet at least. I mean, we hear a lot of, um, you know, uh, Putinology, like Bobby just uh, just called it about, you know, people in his circle wanting to remove him, that, you know, they're worried, the oligarchs, etc. But for now, it looks like he can get away with declaring this whatever, whatever he wants. Um, and when you look at some of the conversations that are being intercepted between Russian soldiers and their relatives back at home, their mothers, some of which are absolutely horrific about torture of POWs, Ukrainians, uh, dismemberment of, of Ukrainians, um, talking about Nazis, uh, that they're being you know, killed by Russians and this is a victory. You have a sense that the narrative that Putin has planted in a lot of the minds of some Russians um, is, is there and is going to be enough for him to justify whatever has happened over the last two months amongst his uh, his public and the other ones, frankly, you know, don't don't really um, don't really matter. Um, and for those who are on the battlefield, you know, Russian soldiers who don't understand why they're there, uh, we've read some of these stories as well. You know, they're not going to be able to really change the course of things. And for them, whether there's a victory speech or a war declaration or other, um, is almost um, is almost irrelevant to them because their voice doesn't matter in the greater scheme of things. So I, I think, uh, uh, Kim, uh, the point you make uh, is a good turning point to, to Nahal, uh, because part of the strategy of maintaining what, you know, the ability to do whatever he wants to do is to make sure that critics uh, within the country are no longer there. And um, uh, he has not only uh, 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 encouraged people to leave if they didn't like the regime, he's, he's actively pursuing a policy where he wants to remove those people, foreign agents or whatever else they're being called, uh, who might be critics uh, of the regime. And by one report that I saw this morning, over 3 million Russians have already left in the first a quarter of this year, which is a remarkable number. It, it creates both an opportunity, uh, uh, Nahal, and you've just uh, uh, dropped a story on this, uh, of, uh, written a story at, at Politico uh, uh, on this for thinking through. There's a lot of you know art, artists and scientists and, and, and folks with a great education and, and a great set of skills that uh, would be help, very helpful in the United States and Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, people are starting to think about how to do that. Uh, what uh, What is your reporting show on this, uh, Nahal? Yes. Uh, so you're right. I mean, Putin has coupled his invasion of Ukraine with a severe crackdown at home. And then when you add the sanctions on top of it, you have people in the IT field, uh, engineers, scientists, these sorts of people seeing, thinking, we have no future here. Uh, not to mention the political dissidents, the artists, as you said, LGBT uh, activists. So a lot of people have left the country and they are showing up, uh, according to a State Department cable that I obtained, uh, they are showing up at U.S. embassies uh, and presumably other embassies, but definitely U.S. embassies all over the world. Uh, seeking visas to the United States. Uh, many of them say they want tourist visas, but it's very clear that they are looking to emigrate on a more permanent basis to the U.S. Now, it's a very sensitive issue. Um, also, I should add, thousands of Russians are also showing up at the U.S.-Mexico border uh, trying to uh, find a way to get in and, and get asylum to the U.S., as are Ukrainians. Uh, now, there are some folks who say, look, this is an opportunity for the United States. A lot of these people are the best and the brightest Russia has to offer. We should take as many of them as we can. It sends a really strong message to ordinary Russians about the generosity of the U.S. Uh, and it also accelerates brain drain 
uh, from Vladimir Putin's Russia, uh, a type of drain that he says that he's happy with. He, he says he's fine with getting rid of these people he calls traitors. But over time, you know, when the Russian IT sector falls apart because it's its people are leaving, uh, he's not going to be so happy. But it's also politically sensitive. There's already been some Republican lawmakers who've written to uh, the Homeland Security Department saying, hey, we hear there's all these illegal Russians coming in. Uh, are, you know, are you sure that they are not security threats? Uh, so whereas there's a lot of bipartisan support for letting in Ukrainians and the U.S. has set up uh, an entire program to let in Ukrainians, uh, the administration still hasn't done anything specific to Russians uh, except for two things. One is it's trying to reduce the visa requirements for Russian scientists and tech workers. Um, that's something it's proposed and Congress would, you know, in theory, put it in legislation if, if it's willing to, if it doesn't face resistance. Uh, and I am told that the U.S. is looking at ways to increase Russians' access to our refugee program. Uh, I'm not being given any details on that. It's still in the works uh, but that is the type of thing that's going to take years and years and years to manifest because the refugee program is such a mess uh, after the Trump years. So it's it's a very sensitive and interesting issue because, again, there's lots of love for the Ukrainians right now. Uh, but there are all these Russians who need help. All of these people are fleeing Vladimir Putin. And I should say that the Russians and the, their supporters are the first to say that the Ukrainians whose cities are being bombed deserve preference. Uh, a, a tough set of issues, uh, uh, Bobby, you wanted to jump in here, uh, but also uh, there is this tendency to to open up the doors when it's about, you know, European people uh, and European looking people uh, in, in the United States and, and be slightly less willing to do so, although we did get 70,000 uh, Afghans out of Afghanistan in, in, in two weeks. Uh, uh, but even that process has had uh, its its various problems. Uh, uh, I know you want to jump in, but if you can comment on that too, that uh, that would be important. Yeah, actually, that's exactly what I wanted to jump in with. Um, that you know, we're, we we used to be better at this during the Cold War when uh, when the U.S. was interested in in attracting talent from uh, Soviet and and Soviet affiliated regimes. Um, the channels were a little more open. We're not we're not as good at that anymore. Um, we've not been very good at, for instance, with the Iranians um, uh, or uh, with North Koreans and, and and others like other regimes like that, Venezuelans. Um, the 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 system gets gummed up by bureaucracy, by paperwork. Um, there is a tendency to over to be over cautious on the on the part of individual civil service individual bureaucrats a visa processing officer sitting in in uh, in a far flung embassy has ridiculous amounts of power uh, to decide whether or not uh, someone uh, should get their visa so th this would require more than just a statement of intent or more than a piece of legislation from washington this would require cleansing the entire pipeline and making sure that it is, to continue with the analogy, better lubricated, that allows people to come in. Um, there will be, uh, you know, anxiety about the identities of some of the people coming in, and that anxiety is understandable after all, although I suspect the majority of Russians who've, le who've left have no love for uh, the Putin regime, there might some be some Russians who are moving simply opportunistically, simply because they they see that there are better economic opportunities, or certainly the economic opportunities back home are no longer uh, worth sticking around for, uh, and that they're looking for a way out, and that they may bring with them their pro-Putin uh, ideas. But that's that can't be the reason to block the entire channel, um, and. We have to get better at identifying who those people are. These risks existed even during the Cold War. Um, that there were always a risk that somebody being allowed in from the Soviet Union was a spy um, rather than a genuine uh, defector. Uh, we developed systems to identify uh, the spies back then. They were not perfect, but they were pretty good. Uh, we need better systems because the volume of people crossing is much larger. But we need to do that quickly, and we need to do it with the understanding that it is not simply something that can be solved in Washington. It is something that will need to be solved at every embassy, every consulate where these people are turning. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think uh, perhaps this will give us the incentive to really uh, 
you know, basically start over uh, because the system is 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 just totally broken. Nahal, last point, then I want to go to Kim. Yeah, I just want to say it's been a really good week for scoops at Politico. So definitely check out my story <laughs> on Politico.com. And I wrote it with my colleague, Joseph Gideon. So it wasn't just me. <laughs> yeah, no, no. All right. Scoop uh, for scoops. You Well, anyway, just read the news. Uh, but yes, it's been a pretty good week for uh, for scoops. Uh, uh, Kim. Um, I want to go back to something you said at the at, at the very outset, the 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 sort of the impact of the war uh, and the changing way in which it has evolved on on the Middle East writ large. And in particular, I think in the important point you made about how people were looking at the United States and maybe changing their views. I imagine that's that's true, uh, uh, particularly in the Gulf. Uh, but it's also true maybe in, in Israel, which has had an interesting uh, week. Uh, 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 of its own, but you're you're a student of the re- of of the region. Uh, uh, very interested to see how things are changing and what direction they may be going. Things are definitely changing. I'm not sure that we can ascertain yet exactly in which direction. Um, but as I said, I think people are revisiting their initial reactions to the beginning at the beginning um, of this uh, of this war. And I'll give you, you know, two statements which, for me, um, sum up where where we are. And they're, you know, variations on famous statements. One of them is, "You may not care about the Middle East, but the Middle East cares about you," and that's why, you know, the U.S. may want to disengage, may want to downsize, right size, how much it does in the Middle East. Um, President Biden may not want to have to do anything with Saudi Arabia, call it a pariah state, whatever you want. There comes a moment where suddenly the Middle East is back and you need it because of oil prices, because of, um, uh, um, you know, Russian money flowing to the UAE, because of um, Israel's concerns about uh, if it votes against um, uh, Russia in in at the UN, it may find itself interdicted from flying over Syria, where it's trying to target Iranian assets. So, the Middle East somehow always comes back to take not center stage because Ukraine is center stage, but it's always there as an arena where a lot of these geopolitical changes and movements are taking place. And the other. Um, statement is, you know, what happens in the Middle East, unlike Vegas, doesn't stay in the Middle East. And there is, you know, the the, the crucial uh, point about where Putin trained his military, maybe not successfully, but where he, you know, um, uh, uh, used what which country he used as a training ground for the military, for new weaponry, for cyber warfare, uh, for testing the boundaries of what he can get away with in the West. And that, of course, was Syria. And I will never forget American officials in the second Obama administration telling me, well, you know, Syria is not a national security interest for us. We can cart it off to Russia. We can cauterize the wound. And I, you know, I, I, I didn't know how to predict wh- how that was going to be wrong precisely, but it was clear that that was just not something that you could really expect from developments in the Middle East. And here we are today. Um, you know, the U.S. needs Saudi Arabia. Um, there is going to be a visit by the president of the United States to the Middle East um, towards the end of June, you know, we're not quite sure exactly where he's going to go. He's definitely going to, to Israel. There might be some kind of regional summit somewhere. You know, Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, you know, the headline was, you know, a little bit embarrassing, I think, for the U.S. had to apologize to the UAE for not having called. I think it was a, I think it was a political story. Um, Nahal, you, you win again. <laughs> uh, having to apologize for not having called UAE leaders quickly enough when the UAE was targeted by, by Houthi missiles. Now, just to answer your question and, 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 and wrap up uh, precisely, at the very beginning, because countries in the Gulf feel and have felt that the US has been a feckle ally, has not stood by its allies, has not delivered on Syria, has you know, turned its back on Afghanistan, has not delivered on you know, uh, um, the continuation of maximum pressure on Iran. 
you know, for various countries, country uh, for various reasons, countries like Saudi Arabia, Israel, and uh, and the UAE have felt that they had to hedge their bets and try to maintain a neutral stance. I think that as they see the U.S. really continue its ability with its ability to rally around uh, Ukraine and provide support for an ally and show off Russia for for what it is, you know, there might be some some more shifting in their positions and some more willingness to work um, with the U.S. Oh, yeah. No, I think uh, yeah. that was... That, that, <laughs> I'm very that, eager. That was great. Now, I'll jump in, though. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> eager to talk about this. So I have been trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And I tweeted about this, like, the more I learn, the less I know. I am just... Deeply, it was one of the most deeply frustrating reporting experiences I've had recently. Just trying to figure out what's going on with our relationship with with the Gulf, especially the Saudis and the Emiratis. So, a couple of things. First of all, um, it was not a Politico scoop; it was Axios. And my understanding was is that it was not accurate. Tony Blinken did not apologize. Um, it was more that he was like, "Oh, yeah, it's too bad you felt bad about that." So, you know, it didn't rise yeah. to the level of an apology. Uh, but secondly, there are a lot of U.S. officials right now who are deeply frustrated with the Saudis and the Emiratis in particular. And I'm talking people even in the Middle East Bureau of the State Department, which is not known for its you know, ability to be really frustrated with these two, two countries. And there are folks who are like, look, if you're not willing to help us on Ukraine when we need you to up the output on oil, if you're not willing to do this for us, then what, what is the point of this relationship? I mean... There are genuine questions about what what the future of our partnership with some of these countries look like. Is it going to be a genuine one that um, is not about transactionalism, or is it going to just be a transactional uh, type of thing going forward? And that that I found very interesting. At the same time, you have folks like at the National Security Council and elsewhere who are doing everything they can to still nonetheless keep this relationship on track. It is honestly like the thing that the thing that kept going through my head was we need to like send these countries and the U S to marriage counseling or something, because they just need some serious therapy. It is so, I, I, by the end of it, I didn't even know. And it was really interesting because like, just like two weeks ago, the wall street journal had this story about how the U S and the Saudi relationship is like at its worst point in years. And then like, at what a day ago or whatever, like there's a piece on their editorial page about how things are beginning to thaw and things are getting better. And I just don't know what to believe. I just think that I just think that, you know, maybe they need to like take a break and figure out what they really want from one another. And if they, you know, want to stay in this relationship or not, I, I just don't know, but I, it's going to be, whoever ends up being the marriage therapist in that, in that <laughs> situation is going to have a lot of work on their hands. So I think, I think Nahal, your frustration actually reflects the nature of the relationship and, and, <laughs> and which is that there are fundamental differences within the United States government. And I believe there are fundamental differences on the other side about what the nature of the relationship is going to be. And it's gone through so many upheavals uh, in, in, in some way. Uh, but Bobby, you wrote about this as well. Uh, of course, Bill Burns, uh, Wall Street Journal scoop, uh, let's uh, put it out there. Uh, Bill Burns uh, uh, traveled to, um, to, to Saudi. Uh, Arabia a month ago, uh, and had and every time Bill Burns travels, something we know that the president is very interested in. So, uh, that's a sign. Uh, uh, how do you how do you see the uh, relationship evolving? Well, for a start, I, I'm happy to volunteer to be the marriage counselor. I charge an <laughs> hourly rate. Um, and, and no guarantee. I, I think it's more a child parent uh, counseling rather mm -hmm. than a marriage counseling. Yeah, <laughs> but in, in this instance, I'm not entirely sure which is the child and which is the parent. And, and the point I made in my they change, speech, right? Yes, yeah. so the well, point I made is the superpower. That's the other question. Which there is that too. That's true. And and I, I think there is enough blame to go around on both sides. I think the U.S. has, has for some years now been signaling to the Middle East that we don't care about you so much anymore. This talk about pivoting east pivoting east and, and let's make a quick deal with the Iranians and then we, we don't have to think about the Middle East anymore. We'll, we'll go away and focus on, on China. Set aside the question about why the United States can only focus at one part of the world uh, at a time. I mean, we're a superpower. If, if we can't walk and chew gum, then what is a superpower? We should be able to walk, chew gum and hum a tune at the same time. Um, but 
put that aside. We've been signaling to the Middle East that we don't want to be their friend very much. We just want to move away. And, and we can't then turn around and say, why are they not behaving like our friends? Uh, the, uh, President Biden's attitude towards uh, MBS, the, the crown prince and, and de facto ruler of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, a thoroughly odious fellow. But to pick him out and say, he, I want to make him an international pariah, but I'm perfectly happy hanging out with, uh, with uh, President Sisi of, uh, of Egypt and, and take his calls, that makes no sense. It's completely inconsistent. The, on the one hand, the US is, uh, wants to make an example of this guy. On the other hand, uh, this other guy, who's got far more uh, blood on his hands, by the way, we're perfectly happy to uh, to indulge him and his requests and his interests. This makes no sense. This is bad policy making in Washington. Now, on the other side, in Riyadh, you have a, a young man who's behaving like a, an even younger man, um, and and he's he's pouting. He's he's responding by not taking the president's call. Who the hell do you think you are that you don't take the call of the president of the United States? I mean, the, the you know. Kim Jong-un would take the call of the president of the United States. And not to do that is, is not just discourteous and bad politics. It's just silly. So you have really stupid postures and stupid behaviors from both sides, and they have to get over it. To Kim's point, the Middle East is far too important for this kind of cavalier uh, uh, attitude to say that we're going to move on from the Middle East. The Middle East is not moving on. It's right there. And it's in the heart of American interests. And both President Biden and MBS have to grow the hell up. All right. Well, that was a strong statement. Uh, and, and, and I think... Uh, uh, Parental counseling, some counseling. We now know we'll, we'll take. We'll, we'll, the, I think the three of you. We will volunteer all three of you as part of a team uh, to 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 be part of it. Uh, but it is a serious. It, it 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 is a very serious set of issues, and and it, and it, it is this perennial problem. Uh, I, I totally agree with Bobby that you need to be able to walk, chew gum, uh, blow bubbles, sing a tune, all at the same time if you're a superpower. I, I, I get it. Uh, that that that's totally it. But there's this perennial problem about expectations uh, in, in the Middle East on both sides uh, that really has evolved. And 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 there's the Iran issue that that is part and parcel of that as well. Uh, so Kim, as as the as as the grown up, uh, uh, how 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 do you think we, you know we ought to move forward on this? I wanted to say um, something about um, the, you know, where where we are right now uh, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and how they're hedging their bets or coming around, and are they being petulant or are they being childish? Are they being the grown up? Who's you know? You're right, Ivo. It's a very serious set of set of issues. There are a lot of uh, problems that the Middle East is still dealing with that the U.S. can be. Um, helpful with or essential to, uh, you know, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to droughts, when it comes to, you know, rising food prices. I mean, we, the U.S. can. We've seen it before. I mean, I've seen it traveling with the Secretary of State around the world while there was a, you know, uprisings in um, in the Middle East, a tsunami and a nuclear uh, disaster in 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 um, in Japan, and you know, Saudi troops marching into Bahrain. You can they can deal. Um, with all of it. Is this just sometimes they choose not to because they want to focus on one thing. Um, how we move forward, I think a lot of it is going to depend on whether the administration is going to be able to continue to stay the course, to rally its friends, to um, keep NATO together, um, to continue to impose those sanctions and have really a cohesive uh, uh, alliance in the face of, of of Russia, and I think we should stop calling it, you know, democracy, uh, you know, versus versus autocracies, because you're going to need some autocracies, and some of them are called Saudi Arabia in this um, in this fight. And then the second point I would say, when it comes to countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, um, they're acting petulant, but they're also trying to guard their interests uh, when it comes to um, what they need for their own sense of security or trade. You know, if you upset China, the consequences are much bigger 
than if you upset Saudi, uh, than if you upset the U.S. You don't get sanctioned. Uh, you don't get uh, um, uh, the same kind of reaction from Russia or China uh, than you would from the U.S. You can get away with a lot more if the U.S. is your partner and you upset the U.S. And we we've, we've seen that, and that's where the UAE and and also Israel, as I was mentioning, you know, the strikes against Israeli strikes against Iranian assets in Syria. They don't want to find the Russians interdicting those. Um, you know, those those air sorties. So that's how they're viewing the, the, the issue. And, you know, they're also looking at domestic politics in the U.S. They're going to be looking at the midterms and they're going to be looking at whether Trump is going to come back and whether they may sh- maybe should just ride this out uh, until, you know, their 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 favorite uh, president comes back into into the White House. So the United States also needs to get its own house into order and exude a sense of stability to the outside world so that it, its own policies and the decisions of POTUS um, get taken seriously and, and abided by in the long term. And I think you wrapped it up exactly right uh, on two really big issues. If we want to understand why countries do what they do, put yourself in their shoes and see mm. what their interests are and then work it from there. Uh, probably a pretty good way to do diplomacy in the first instance. And then um, before telling other people how they should behave, perhaps look at what uh, is happening uh, in your own country. I think two very, very uh, fair points for what is and will remain a very difficult uh, and contentious set of relationships, as they have long been uh, and just will be for, for, for more time. And, and to all of us, we will we will try to figure it out, uh, look at it. Uh, at some point, counselors will be necessary. We now know we have counselors here uh, to help out. In the meantime, I really want to thank Bobby and, and Nahal and Kim for uh, excellent conversation across a whole wide range of issues here on World Review. We'll be back next week with another edition of World Review. Until then, have a great weekend.